The first time I saw a penis was at the age of 19. I was strolling around Iceland and stumbled upon the Penis Museum. Growing up in China, that was my first sex education and my first time seeing a mature penis in a jar soaking for marlin. But that led me thinking, where's the vagina museum and the clitoris museum? So brace yourself for the sex education that I didn't get to learn when I was 19. Let's take a look at this image. This is not a penis. It's actually a clitoris, a hyena's clitoris. Elephants have similar ones, and they are 40 centimeters long. During mating, when the females feel like it, they retract the clitoris and create an opening that the male can insert the penis. Because of this, it is physically impossible for a male to force sexual activity on a female unless she is completely willing. Both hyenas and elephants are matriarchal species, meaning they are organized around a social system where leadership and authority are predominantly held by females. Their anatomy has influenced their social structure. In their world, power dynamics look very different from the imbalances we often see in human societies. It wasn't until two years ago, in 2022, that scientists found out snakes have clitoris. These hemiclitoris contain nerves and erectile tissue, suggesting they serve as a reproductive function and not just about decoration. Now we can consider mating in snakes is not about coercion or force, but seduction, stimulation, and pleasure. But these clitoris were mistaken as scent gland for many years. So why did it take so long for us to discover this? For centuries, science has been dominated by men who weren't as interested in the female anatomy as in the male anatomy. We talk about the clitoris and G-spot like they are myths. We accurately map the clitoris decades after we sent men to the moon, and 150 years after we mapped the penis. In the Middle Ages, witch hunting guides referred to the clitoris as the devil's teat and claimed only witch have one. So we decided to take matters into our own hands. We said to grow a living clitoris in a dish. Here is the newly found understudied science fact. In menstrual blood, there are stem cells, and they are pluripotent, meaning they can differentiate into specialized cells and grow into organs. What's more, they can differentiate into the widest range of cell types compared to most other stem cells, making them excep exceptionally versatile. So in the lab, we set out to see where this could take us. We collected our menstrual blood, harvested the stem cells within, and differentiated or turned them into erectile cells and neural cells. Then implanted this into the clitoris structure using 3D bell printing. These are some of the neural cells that grew from our menstrual stem cells. With this, we're able to grow a clitoris that can sense and think. So if it's a living clitoris that can sense and think, is it a sentient being? Can it sense arousal and have pleasure? Scientists have proved that human brain cells in a dish can play the game Pong. So what can a clitoris in a dish do? She could swipe Tinder, literally think with their clitoris. Is it the same as lab-grown meat? Technically it is, and ideally you want to put both in your mouth. To follow the growth of this clitoris in a dish, find us on OnlyFans at Sentin Clit. We are flipping the script on biocapitalism, using a platform built for objectification to reclaim narratives of sex, pleasure, and science. Beyond artistic inquiry, lab-grown clitoris could potentially be organ implant for the more than 200 million women and girls alive today who have gone through genital mutilation. This could also bring help to transgender or intersex women seeking gender affirmative care. The clitoris is not the only understudied part of the female anatomy. 
menstrual blood that comes out of from our body every month. A lot of time it's painful, messy, and to some disgusting. So naturally I thought there must be something interesting in here. So I put out a tampon and put it in front of my husband's face, who is a scientist and my longtime collaborator. I asked him, what's in this? To understand more, I began collecting my menstrual blood and used more than max spectrometry to analyze the proteins inside. We found out uh, many unique proteins that only exist in menstrual blood and not in the normal blood. Many of these proteins are linked to fertility, endometriosis, and cervical cancer. That could become the key to long-term health tracking. Without the need of needles, this blood that we already produce and discard every month can be our non-invasive way of monthly health tracks. And because I pep had lots of menstrual blood, as you can imagine, I got very familiar with odor. So drawing on my artistic background, I made an olfactory piece called Menstrual Garden, which gives us another way to visualize the science behind our research. The three-cent bottle contained the smell of fresh menstrual blood, stagnant menstrual blood, and menstrual pain with the scent of blood and cramp relief patches. One bottle contains the top 10 proteins found uniquely in menstrual blood, and I've enlarged and clutched them so you can see their intricate shapes and folding patterns. Another bottle contained the organ garden grow out of the menstrual blood. You see, menstrual blood holds incredible potential. It may one day help grow life-saving organs. Currently, stem cells are typically collected through invasive methods like bone marrow aspiration or fat tissue biopsies, which require anesthetic medical procedures. In contrast, menstrual blood offers a non-invasive, accessible alternative for gathering stem cells. Recent studies have shown that stem cells from menstrual blood could be used to treat conditions like Alzheimer's disease by differentiating menstrual stem cells into neural cells to replace those that have died. Researchers have also cultivated heart cells from these stem cells to repair damaged heart tissue. I like to call it use menstrual blood to patch a broken heart. Every year, more than 20,000 people around the world are waiting for heart transplants. Now, imagine if a heart could be grown from our own menstrual blood, allowing for treatment that not only bypasses invasive procedures, but also reduces the risk of immune rejection. I'm trying to grow a heart from my menstrual blood for my mom. Two years ago, she suffered a heart attack. It was a painful reminder of how women are overlooked in medical science. Her symptoms didn't fit the typical profile for a heart attack, symptoms more often associated with men. And even doctors failed to recognize the danger. The delay in diagnosis has left my mom still unwilling to acknowledge that she has her disease. This experience inspired my partner Cooper and I to co-found a company with the main mission to provide accessible, accurate, and affordable heart disease testing and to coach people on prevention so that people like my mom can get the help they need before it's too late. Like growing the clitoris, I use stem cells from my menstrual blood and differentiate them into heart cells using 3D bioprinting, we created a heart-like structure as a home for these cells to grow. One day, this will become a fully functioning organ as a gift to my mother, who continues to struggle with heart disease. Just as she once created my heart in her womb, I'm giving her a heart grown from my own, womb's menstrual blood. But that is not the only thing my mother gave me. I've already told you about the gender imbalances in science, but some of you may not know the gender imbalance faced by so many in China. During the one-child policy, many families decided to have abortion when they discovered the baby was a girl. I wouldn't exist in this world if my mom didn't insist on saving me. And she spent lots of effort, time, and finance to give me a great education, 
when others didn't believe a girl deserved it. Although my mom does not claim to be a feminist, she might be the best I know. It's not enough to complain about these issues, but rather invest in changing them. She prioritized my education, and I have used that opportunity to advantage uh, not just about myself, but women at large. Now, I aim to turn menstruation, a taboo and sometimes disgusting process, into a superpower. A superpower that can aid in making sex pleasurable to victims of genital mutilation, transgender women and intersex women, as well as a non-invasive way to check overall health. It has shown progress in treating disease such as Alzheimer's disease, and this superpower can decrease the number of people on organ transplant wait lists and provide them with life-saving care that they need. But I'm not naive. The world doesn't seem to like it when women have superpowers. Women have the power to give birth. They bend our freedom to choose. When we have the power to grow organs, will it be banned? Will it be exploited? What new body politics does this superpower can create? Can it create advantages? Could this superpower tilt the balance of power between warm holders and those without, as we've seen societies like the hyenas and elephant? So I'll leave you with this. Invest in research that helps women, because it actually helps us all. And if you feel especially called to help, visit me at my lab. I am currently in need of some more menstrual blood. Because there's a baby girl in my belly now. I don't menstruate this year. <laughs> and hope when she grows up, I'll be able to show her the clitoris museum. Thank you. Yeah.